It was in May of 1543 that it all started. Nobody remembers the exact day, but I'm thinking it might have been a Wednesday. As the sun rose on that fateful morning, modern science was born. It was on this day that Nicholas Copernicus published his opus, De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, or for those of you whose Latin is a bit rusty, on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres. This book laid out mathematical arguments for the heliocentric universe and rejected geocentrism. In plain English, he said that the sun and not the earth was the center of the universe. Sadly, Copernicus died on May 24th of the same year, so he never saw his scientific revolution unfold. It might be a bit early in this course to indulge in anything self-congratulatory, but I'm going to do so even so. The discipline of science has had a bigger impact on humanity than any other development. And I don't say that lightly, as things like philosophy, religion, and art have all affected the lives of billions of people. But science is the biggest. Some important advances were made even before modern science was developed, things like the taming of fire, metallurgy, animal husbandry, and shipbuilding. But modern science greatly accelerated our progress. Over the last five centuries, we have learned to exploit electricity and magnetism, understood the germ theory of diseases, and even harnessed the power hidden inside the nucleus of atoms. Chemists have created substances that have vastly simplified our lives. We can treat cancer and vaccinate our children so they live past infancy. Science is truly incredible. Science can also be intimidating, what with all those facts and figures and equations and whatnot. For that reason, many people leave science to the scientist. People like, well, me, for example. I'm a scientist, a physicist to be precise, and I've spent years immersing myself in all sorts of fascinating corners of the natural world. It's been great fun, by the way, and if you're a young person thinking about your career, I strongly recommend it. You will spend your entire life in a constant state of wonder, and your days will be as full as you uncover the laws of nature. I've never regretted it. That's my tip for the day. Most people don't dig that deeply into science. Instead, they learn what they're taught in school and science class. Most of you viewing this course benefit from having lived in a society that values an educated populace. So you sat through classes learning about Louis XIV, gerunds, prime numbers, and yes, science. And of course, that's what this course is all about. I want to talk to you about the science you learned when you were younger. So just how good was that science education? On the whole, I'm sure that it was very good. I really must tip my hat to the hardworking science teachers out there. They're able to convey a great deal of information on a vast range of scientific topics. Things like biology, geology, astronomy, chemistry, and physics, which is, of course, my personal favorite. They taught you tons of stuff. However, in teaching such a huge array of subjects, compromises must be made. Teachers had to teach things that weren't really wrong, but were only a piece of the fuller story. You might have learned about the ideal gas law in chemistry, and it's a good approximation, but it's not completely accurate. It works on only special cases and not in all of them. Maybe you learned about the Bernoulli equation and how it explains how planes fly. And there's merit to the way it's usually taught, but it clearly isn't the whole story. For instance, it doesn't explain how planes can fly upside down. And then there's Einstein's special theory of relativity, which tells us that we can't go faster than light. Well, that part is true. However, those same lectures will sometimes tell you that the reason that you can't go faster than light is because an object's mass increases as you go faster. And that, I'm afraid to say, is totally wrong. It's just not what happens. So that's what this course is all about. As you watch the 24 lectures that will be together, I'll talk about common misconceptions of science. And I'm not talking about the misconceptions of youth, like being told that the reason that we have seasons is because the Earth is variously closer and further from the Sun. I'm talking about misconceptions that are taught in fairly advanced classes and are often believed by people with a quite respectable scientific education. I'm talking about ways in which you might have been taught wrong. Now, before we dive into the course, I want to make it clear that I'm not criticizing your teachers. 
Teachers have to make decisions on how they present the material, and sometimes telling a partial truth is a way to get across a big idea. For instance, I have personally taught people that whole mass increases as you go faster thing as a way to convince students that you can't go faster than light. So I'm not blameless myself. Sometimes a small misconception can facilitate a much bigger truth. That's just the nature of education. Okay, so let me tell you how I will lay out these lectures. To begin with, this is a broad survey course, and I can't assume that you'll have prior knowledge of all of the subject matter we'll cover. I mean, it may well be that you are personally a science whiz, but there may be some subjects where your memory is kind of fuzzy. So what I intend to do is begin each 30-minute lecture with a very fast lesson in a way that highlights how the misconception is commonly taught. And I'll point out the misconception that I intend to dispel. That way, you can appreciate the meat of each lecture with equal appreciation, or, well, at least I hope so. There are two subjects for which I'll do things a little differently, and those are quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of special relativity. Those two subjects are incredibly cool and mind-bending and are just utterly chock-a-block full of misconceptions. However, since they are mind-bending, I will devote an hour, two lectures, to each of them with more introductory explanations. In fact, it will be difficult to cover either of those topics in an hour, although I'll cover the high points. And if you find that you're interested in the subjects, well, then the Great Courses Company has courses on both of those subjects. Not by me, but fascinating courses nonetheless. So that's the plan. Each lecture will have a short review of the subject, followed by me pointing out the misconception and then the real story. Sounds like fun, right? Let's begin. Now, before we talk about specific scientific facts, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about science itself. So just what is science? Well, that depends a lot on who you ask. Many people would say that science is a collection of facts. Things like the Earth is four and a half billion years old, or the Egyptian pyramids were made by aliens using UFOs. That last one isn't real, by the way. But it does lead us to the core essence of what science is. Science isn't so much a series of facts, but rather a way of observing the world and generating testable hypotheses. Those hypotheses can be confirmed, like the age of the Earth, or they can be falsified, like the whole UFO pyramid connection. Once the hypotheses are confirmed, they can be taken as facts. But facts in science can be soft things. They're not facts like saying that George Washington was the first president of the United States. They're more malleable, like Newton's Law of Gravity, which is still a good enough scientific theory that we can use it to calculate orbital parameters and rocket trajectories and accurately send a probe to Pluto. But when Newton's theory of gravity was proven to be incomplete, it was replaced by Einstein's theory of general relativity. Scientific facts and ideas can change as new information comes in. That way of thinking about facts is discomforting to some who want an unchanging worldview, but it's the flexibility of science that gives it such power. Ideas work as long as they work and to a needed level of accuracy, but they can be discarded when new information comes in or a higher level of accuracy is needed. But facts themselves aren't science either. Science certainly does include determining facts, but it also includes seeing how those facts can be woven together into a tapestry that tells a bigger story. It's about understanding cause and effect and distinguishing those two things from simple correlation. Correlation is simply a fancy term for saying that two things happen together, but as the saying goes, correlation isn't causation, which means that just because two things happen together, doesn't mean that one causes the other. For instance, my secretary gets to work a couple of hours earlier than I do. Now, that's not because I'm a bum. She gets to work at 5 a.m. every day. She's a crazy early bird. I roll in at about 7.30. Those two events happen pretty much every day. So someone could observe those events and conclude that her arriving at work causes me to appear. That would be a credible hypothesis. But, of course, her arrival doesn't cause me to show up. We both are governed by a bigger process, which is the start of the workday. Our arrival doesn't depend on each other. Our arrival depends on a larger truth. 
And this sort of thing is true in science. If you live in the right part of the country, you'll see geese flying south in the fall, and a few months later, it will begin to snow. It's not that the geese somehow keep the snow away, but rather both phenomena can be explained by the orbit of our planet, which is governed by the law of gravity and some historical accidents which determined the tilt of the Earth. So science is a really big thing. It's built on facts, sure, but it's also a methodology for determining and accepting or rejecting those facts. It's a process for fitting those facts into some sort of interconnected whole, which in turn results in a big picture, a view of the way nature works. It's an extremely powerful tool. And inherent in science is a perpetual level of uncertainty and ignorance. Science has to be prepared to change and grow. Before about the 1930s, the idea of galaxies was foreign to us. The location of stars in the sky seemed to be mostly uniform, except for the Milky Way, or what the Finnish people once called Leninrata, or the Way of the Birds. The Milky Way is a stripe in the night sky that is brighter than the other parts. The familiar name comes from Greek mythology when the goddess Hera was suckling the demigod Heracles, and a few drops of milk were spilled and consequently spread across the sky. The real reason for that brighter patch of sky is, of course, because the Milky Way is a galaxy and we're looking at it edgewise and there are more stars there. By the way, the Leninrata term originates because the ancient Finns thought the Earth was flat and the edge of the Earth was where the birds flew in the winter. According to the legend, they followed the Milky Way to get there, hence the name Way of the Birds. So there are a couple of lessons there. Both the Greeks and the Finns and other ancient people had ideas that were wrong and needed to be changed as more data came in. Of course, both those mythological ideas were discarded centuries ago and replaced with the idea of stars spread mostly uniformly through the heavens. But the galaxy idea wasn't really embraced until the 1930s when powerful new telescopes showed a very different picture of the universe. And that perhaps is the key point. New data means that our scientific picture of the world will change. And if new data will change our picture, then that picture isn't the core of science. Science is more about the process. It's about learning and understanding and synthesizing and revising and repeating the process over and over again, incrementally better understanding the world around us. For those who find comfort in unchanging truths, science isn't the place to look. Now this isn't to say that science is all smoke and mirrors and opinions. There are things that we know that won't likely change. Gravity pulls things downwards. Improved sanitation reduces diseases, and planes really do fly. Those things will be true forever. So I don't want to oversell the uncertainty bit. Just realize that a good scientist must be constantly open to new data and be willing to change his or her views when new observations are encountered. So that's our quick preview of the course and the nature of science. Now let's get down to business. The first order of business is to talk about the scientific method itself and where the ways in which it is normally taught deviates from how it's actually practiced. Most people encounter a description of the scientific method in elementary school or middle school at the latest. That introductory description is based on a recursive method, which one might describe in the following way. Someone starts with an observation of a phenomena. Say they see bumblebees landing on flowers. From this, they form a hypothesis, which is that flowers are a source of food for bees. A hypothesis is de described as an educated guess. The person then does experiments which test the idea. If the experiment fails to support the hypothesis, you reject it. If it succeeds, then you can elevate your hypothesis to the level of a theory, which we might call a tested hypothesis. Finally, if you test the theory over and over again, and it always is supported by the data, you finally elevate your idea to being a law, which is the highest status you can have in science. Examples of that are Newton's law of gravity or Ohm's law, which describes how materials resist the flow of electrical current. You've almost certainly seen some version of this description. It's found in essentially every textbook for young children. It's nice and simple and linear, with A leading to B leading to C. Easy, right? Except that it's not. 
Scientific research is never that simple. I wish it were. It would make my life a whole lot easier, but it's not. The process is considerably messier, with far more twists and turns and revisions and surprises. There are dead ends and false alleys and puzzled looks. Science is way more interesting. And let's talk about the terminology, because that causes us no end of difficulty. I use the word hypothesis to mean an informed guess, theory to mean a tested guess, and law to mean a well-tested guess. Now, it's not that those words are so bad, but they have problems. And that's because words are slippery and tricky things. They have multiple meanings. Of course, it's not a problem when words have multiple meanings. That's just the nature of language. But the problem arises when a speaker uses one meaning and a listener uses another. This problem can be especially bad when the two meanings are similar, but subtly different. Probably the least troublesome of the scientific terms we're discussing is hypothesis. Pretty much everyone uses the term to mean an educated guess or a motivated explanation for something. It's used to describe a fuzzy level of knowledge. There is a much bigger problem when we talk about the word theory. Theory, in the sense of our middle school description of the scientific method, means a tested hypothesis, which means something that is pretty well supported. But for a lot of people, theory is a much dodgier term. It implies a very poorly supported idea. I mean, it doesn't take much creativity to imagine two people arguing and one of them saying to the other one, so what's your theory? And you can even hear the tone of the voice, which conveys a sort of dismissal of the idea as not being worthy of even consideration. This would already be a problem, but scientists use the word in a different way. For us, the term theory is more along the lines of what basic scientific method means when the word law is used. I mean, let's think about some of the frequently used terms and just how confident the scientific community is on that topic. The theory of evolution? No serious scientist questions it. What about the germ theory of disease? Putting aside the imprecise nature of the word germ, this is considered a scientific fact. Microorganisms do indeed cause disease. How about Einstein's theory of general relativity? There's no credible debate over this idea. The GPS on your phone wouldn't work if we didn't take relativity into account. So this is a tremendous communication problem. Scientists sometimes use the word theory in the sense a middle school science teacher means it, but they just as often mean it to imply a very well-established scientific fact. And what about the term law? Well, that term has fallen out of favor. Most scientists don't use the term except in a historical context. For instance, there is Newton's law of gravity and the law of conservation of mass in chemistry. Newton's law was developed in the mid to late 1600s, while the law of conservation of mass originated in the 1700s. The term law was often used in the 1800s in electricity, like Coulomb's law, which describes the force between two electrically charged particles, or Ampere's law, which describes how magnetic fields and electrical currents are connected. The term law in this context originated in the 17th century and stuck around for a few hundred years before falling into disuse among practicing scientists. To give you a sense of how true that is, remember that both Newton's law of gravity and the law of conservation of mass were both demonstrated to fail at high energies and strong gravitational fields. What, might you ask, replaced it? For both cases, it is Einstein's theory of relativity. An idea that we now label a theory is a superior description of nature than an older version that we label a law. It's no wonder that non-scientists are sometimes confused. It's probably worth defining another term that you might not have heard in a scientific context, and that word is model. Model is used a lot these days. There's the standard model, which is near and dear to my own heart, and describes the subatomic world. But other scientists talk about modeling the climate or the weather. There are lots of other examples. The term model is one that tries to more clearly delineate this distinction between the natural world and the ideas we use to describe it. For instance, a hurricane is a hurricane. Winds blow and buildings topple. The hurricane might hit the Florida coast and cross into the Gulf of Mexico, or it might turn northward and travel along the Atlantic seaboard. The hurricane is the reality. However, 
Atmospheric scientists try to predict things before they happen, like the hurricane's intensity and path. They do that not by waiting until it happens, but by taking what they know about the motion of the wind and the transfer of heat from the ocean into the atmosphere and then describe it using complex mathematical equations. Those equations are then put into a computer and solved using numerical methods to predict things that are important to save lives and property. Thus a model is kind of like a theory, although the word model often implies a more calculational aspect than an explanatory one. That's kind of a vague distinction and don't take it too seriously, but broadly speaking, if the goal is to make calculations, scientists more often use the word model, while if the outcome is something that shows an elegant mathematical encapsulation of an underlying truth of nature, the term we usually use is theory. But the distinction is imperfect and not uniformly followed, so be aware that this is a, a bit of a sloppy business. So, if we can dispense with a simplified description of the scientific method you encountered as a child, how is science really done? Well, to begin with, there are more loops and modifications. For instance, the hypothesis generation phase doesn't just come from observations. It can come from that, but it also comes from talking to others, reading the literature, exploring what's known and what's not. These all form an intricate interplay. Then, when you start to take data, you should have predictions with which you can compare your observations. The data isn't usually cut and dried, not like you have a theory of gravity that says that things hover above the ground, which you can prove false by dropping a ball. Most data aren't conclusive. They might support or contradict your idea. You might observe something wholly unexpected, or the data might prove inconclusive. Or they might partially support your idea, which then causes you to modify your hypothesis or change your experiment. Even once you've done your experiment, you need to see if others can replicate it. You need to have others criticize it. I mean, even the best scientists can fool themselves. They can make mistakes. They can overlook things. If you want your idea to be bulletproof, you need to have everything vetted by the most critical process possible. If you have a thin skin, you shouldn't be a scientist because it's a world of constant and brutal critique. Mind you, it's not that your colleagues are being mean. On the contrary, they're trying to help. The goal of science isn't to win an argument, it's to be right. And being right means answering all questions. If you can do that, you might be on to something. If you're a person who plays on the internet, reading discussions on blogs and bulletin boards, you've no doubt encountered arguments of the merits of philosophy and how it's somehow a purer discipline than science. Or maybe you encountered this during college, discussions fueled by the presence of an adult beverage or four. And this is an old conversation. After all, long before the word scientist was coined in 1833 by British philosopher William Wewell, the term used for those who studied science was natural philosopher, implying that they learned about the philosophy of the natural world. In fact, the story of how the term was coined is very revealing. Wewell first used it anonymously in his 1834 review of Mary Somerville's On the Connection of Physical Sciences. Wewell used the term satirically as something of a complaint for the proliferation of terms used to describe scholars, for instance, chemist, mathematician, naturalist, where the term philosopher was once used to mean those who studied all knowledge. In an analogy of how the word artist implied a practitioner of art, a scientist would be one who pursued science. Wewell also coined the term physicist as one who studies physics. There are those in the philosophical community who regard philosophy as the queen of intellectual disciplines from which all the others are originated, and there is some historical merit in that position. However, some then imply that philosophers are somehow superior to other pursuers of knowledge. I see it differently. I see it more in the matter of evolution. For instance, it appears true that the original form of semi-complex animal was a sea sponge. Over millions of years, other forms of animals evolved, including the phylum chordata, which includes mammals and, of course, us. 
And even though our ancestral organism might have been a sponge, that doesn't mean that modern sponges can do calculus. It's more of a schism that occurred early on, and the divergences have made the two organisms very different. In the same way, philosophy allowed science to arise, but the two disciplines are now quite distinct. And science is the more interesting of the two. Just saying. Academic trash-talking aside, there are two core ideas of philosophy which you must be aware to understand science. And I won't describe them rigorously here. If you're interested, the teaching company has many relevant courses in philosophy. But it's important to be aware of these two, metaphysics and epistemology. Metaphysics is just the study of existence. It might, very broadly speaking, be described as being concerned with two questions, which are what exists and what is it like. Metaphysics is recognizably related to physics, but there are some very deep questions one might ask about existence. For instance, we could ask whether there's an objective reality that exists without us. That's like the question, if a tree falls in a forest and there's nobody there, does it make a sound? And, of course, most scientists would say yes, if by sound you mean vibrations of air that are, at least in principle, hearable. Other philosophers say that there is no reality other than what exists in our perception. This implies that the existence is in the perceiving, and that leads to questions like whether you see red the same way I do. Obviously, we can't know the answer to that in detail, which means that the conversation will continue. However, scientists have made a choice in this debate. We would come down firmly on the position that there is a reality out there, and that would continue to exist even if we didn't. Now, this brings us to the second term, epistemology, which might be called the philosophy of knowledge. It is concerned with such questions of whether we can know anything for sure and what it means to rationally believe in something. And this is an important consideration for scientists because we build our theories and models on the basis of observations. If our observations are somehow flawed, then our theories will also be flawed. And this is very important. It could mean that at the very deepest and most philosophical level, we can never be sure of our science. I mean, imagine for the moment that you're being held in a giant vat with all of your sensory information fed to you, kind of like in the movie The Matrix. Then, you wouldn't actually know anything at all. In fact, our science would be totally wrong. The Matrix is a good movie, by the way, and it raises some philosophical topics relevant to scientists. Now, this doesn't stop us in our quest for what science is. We can move on and make great progress in our understanding of the universe. But it's important to realize that we're actually taking a leap of faith. And this faith involves believing that our senses are a mostly accurate representation of reality and that there's no evil demon or laboratory master that's deceiving us. Personally, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that. I would like to take a moment to address those who then say that science is like religion because it re rests on faith. No, I, I completely disagree. Faith is a far more integral component of religion. But it's important for those of us who really want to scientifically understand the universe to be honest and understand the fundamental limitations and weaknesses of our discipline. For the rest of this course, I'm not going to return to this question about whether the world really exists or not. I'm going to assume that it does. I mean, if you can't assume that, then you can't do anything. You might as well not even get out of bed this morning. That is, if you're even in a bed. Spooky, huh? But if we do assume that there is an objective reality and that our senses are a good approximation of the world around us, there is the question of what science can prove. Can the scientific method prove that a theory is true? Well, there's another important aspect of science that takes some getting used to, and that's the idea that science doesn't actually prove anything is true. That might seem weird given what you think about science. Science is always telling you things are true. It tells you the sun will come up tomorrow. It tells you that sugar will rot your teeth. It tells you that the universe was caused in a ginormous explosion called the Big Bang. And all of those things are true, or at least true enough. The idea that science cannot prove things to be true originated most famously in the fertile mind of Austrian philosopher Karl Popper. Popper was one of the most influential philosophers of science in the 20th century, and he wrote extensively on scientific epistemology. It was his contention that the scientific method could not prove that something was true. 
This is because one could have a scientific theory that's right for the wrong reason. To illustrate that idea, think about the explanation of the rising and setting of the sun that was held in Greek mythology. Every day, the Greek titan Helios drove his flaming chariot across the sky. They rise and set, rise and set, day after day. A Greek scientist could predict the rising and setting of the sun using this theory, and, according to the scientific method, he'd be justified in believing it. After all, it made correct predictions. The theory might also predict that if you looked at the sun with a suitable telescope, you'd see the titan and the chariot. However, that prediction wouldn't be observed, and from that you could disprove Greek mythology. In modern days, we say that the rising of the sun is due to the spinning of the earth, and we're comfortable with this idea. However, if tomorrow the sun didn't rise, we'd have to modify our theory. Perhaps the sun stopped burning, or aliens caused the earth to stop spinning. Perhaps it would be a glitch in the matrix. I don't know what, but no matter the reason, we have to change our theory then too. We can think of more realistic examples like Newton's law of gravity, which worked very well for hundreds of years of observations, but was replaced by Einstein's theory of general relativity when Newton's theory couldn't reproduce measurements of the movements of Mercury. This is Popper's core idea, which is that scientific theories can't be proven, only disproven. Essentially, the highest status a scientific theory can have is not dead yet. Now, does this invalidate the scientific method? No, of course it doesn't. But it reminds us of a very important point, which is to say that science is a method more than it's a body of knowledge. The scientific method generates the body of knowledge. It gives us a model of how the world works. But the result isn't static. Things can change. Indeed, things are guaranteed to change. Our understanding is always incomplete. So that's what science is. It's a glorious and powerful intellectual endeavor. It teaches us truths, but we must always be open to a newer and better understanding. And this brings us full circle back to the point of this course. In the remaining lectures, we'll learn about newer and better and more correct ways to understand things than the ones that you were once taught. It's going to be great fun.